everyone. Uh, welcome to this episode of Tying with the Pros. Uh, with us this evening is Justin Hokinson. Uh, Justin is a Muskie Town Pro staffer. Um, he has been in the guide space. Uh, bottom line, he is one of the fishiest dudes uh, I know. Uh, he has put up a number of 50-inch, both fly caught and gear caught fish this year. And uh, we're excited to have him here. So Justin, what are you going to tie tonight? So tonight I'll be working on a pattern that I developed many years ago now called the war pig. And the way this pattern came about, back when I was in college, uh, both, you know, being college students, we were broke and didn't have a lot of money. So my buddy, all he had was an eight weight. So he still wanted to catch a muskie and a fly because he saw the sex I was having. So it's like, all right, I need to figure out a fly for an eight weight that still got down a little bit because we're fishing pretty heavy current in that area. And this is a musky fly for an eight weight? Yes. Okay. And it isn't just a musky fly either. Pretty much you name it, I've caught it on this pattern. Awesome. From sturgeon, I've caught a multiple brown trout on it. Small mouth, of course, large mouth. I know many years ago, I sent a bunch down to Florida for a large mouth down there. Awesome. And now this is, uh, it, we talked a little bit about this before, but this this is an evolution of, uh, what would you call it? Excuse me, uh, of, of an articulated river pig? Yes, that's exactly how I'd word it. Uh, this one won't sink as quick as a river pig because what I'm using is uh, aluminum sea eyes. It won't sink as fast as, say, the lead eyes that are often used on river pigs. Perfect. It still gets down depending on the sink tip you're using, of course, but it'll get down the first foot pretty quickly. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm going to plan on asking a bunch of questions. We want to continue to cater all of these videos to, you know, whether you're an advanced tire or someone who's either just started or considering starting to tie flies. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and try to, you know, let you do your thing as much as possible and, and please explain. But if, uh, if I think there's an opportunity to either add some useful color or to ask a question just for clarification, uh, that's what we can all look forward to tonight. So uh, with that, take it away. Perfect. Of course. So what I'm starting out with here is the, you can use a hook you want to, except the one I found that fits this pattern best for me, uh, Partridge Attitude Extra four rod hooks. That's still one of my all time favorite hooks. There's a lot of hooks that can be substituted for this hook. One would be the uh, five odd Gamakaju. Perfect. And is, are you tying this, you said you're not just tying this on a hook either. I mean, it, before you dive in, right. what are you doing for a platform here? It'll be a hook then on the front. It's going to be a 40 mil big game uh, articulated shank. So the platform essentially would look like this. And, and while Justin's putting that in, for anyone who's uh, making their own shanks, those 40 millimeter shanks are right around an inch and a half. So that's essentially as long as the actual platform will be, it's roughly about uh, two and a half inches long or so, awesome. maybe about three. And how long does the whole fly end up being when you're- The whole fly ends long? up being right about eight. Awesome. And then you'll notice, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> Say, uh, <laughs> Folks who are watching our videos here, as you'll notice kind of a recurring theme that, you know, general use patterns for musky, a lot of, you know, we do, there is a time and a place for those big flies, uh, especially in the fall, but you'll notice that a lot of flies that we tire in the seven to nine inch range, there's definitely a sweet spot. So actually, if we want to talk about that for a minute. So this is a pattern like for musky specifically, I will use this for either heavy current fishing pocket style water like you would for trout. If there's a big couple big boulders in the middle, cast it in behind there. Or it's an awesome throwback fly. So say we moved a fish on a Buford, came in and didn't want to eat. This past summer was a great example of that. We moved this fish six times and we could tell it was going to eat that day. So we just kept swapping flies and I happened to see one of my old war pigs in my buddy's bags immediately threw that on there and he ended up with his pb that's awesome uh what was uh is that the fish with ben yep cool cool yeah uh, that was what's and what's ben's last name just for anybody who uh zeman ben zeman so yeah um I, I remember seeing that fish uh cool 
And the funny part is too, a little more to that story is that wasn't the fish we initially moved. Oh, really? So that fish was teamed up with another fish that was bigger. Because the first one we moved was uh, right beside the boat was roughly about a 45 to 46. Remind me timing. Was this late summer, early fall, or when was it? Would have been, this was such a weird year. It was October, so it was a warm day for October. It was like mid-October when it was like 50s, yes. 60s. Yeah. Yes, because both of them were in just sun shirts. <laughs> so, you know, no sweatshirts or anything like that. Awesome. Well, hey, um, question, just because you're talking about throwing that in moving water. Is that a pattern that you ever throw in still water? Yes. You said, for example, on lakes, I would use it in similar situations. I would use a river pig or a hillbilly deluxe where I'm fishing steeper drop offs or fishing weed edges. So like, I'm not worried about getting caught in the structure itself, if that makes sense. So you, it's a, it's a pattern you wouldn't necessarily throw into say a blow down or a down tree because you wouldn't want to get snagged in there, but more on kind of the edge of structure where a fish yes. is likely to be ambushing. Yes. Unless if there's a down tree, if I'm throwing an intermediate, then you can get away with fishing trees. You just don't want to get it down too quickly because you'll get snagged. Or you just need to have like a hundred of them and, and be ready to swap them out. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. Let's see how what you do here. Uh, what colors are you tying in tonight? So this is still my number one canvas color, except it's going to be a black and orange. I've tied this in a bunch of different colors for different people, but this is my go-to, so that's what I'm tying tonight. And you've got some big ones on black and orange this year, right? Over half the big fish this year was black and orange. Interesting. All the ones would have been on the like natural red horse type colors, the brown and with a little bit of red in it, that kind of a stuff. Well, I want to see you tie this thing. Let's uh, yep. let's let's see how you do this. What type of thread are you using? I'm using the Beavis. This is a 200 diner, the gel spun stuff. So you like to use and, GSP? Yep. And what I'll say for flies out of time on my own, one little trick that saves quite a bit of money. And also you don't, I've broken all gel, gel spuns that you can think of. One thing I started doing is I started using braid for tying my own stuff. Like stuff I'm not giving to friends or anything, just for my personal use. What do you like, spooling up Power Pro or? Yep. What and actually you? my favorite, uh, braid would be the uh spider wire what in what pound test typically a uh, couple of my buddies are using eight except i'm down to using six okay because i've yet to manage to break the six and since that's a lot of weight diameter, for tying thread six pound test is heaps so if you're breaking that you might want to practice uh tension control yes exactly so that's my favorite braid for tying and that's mostly due to the fact it's a little bit of a rounder braid. So when you're reverse tying, it actually layers up really nicely while you're building that dam. Nice. Yeah, I, I've noticed that when tying uh, different types of power, because I, I think Sully was another guy that likes to spool up uh, power probe and braid on, on spools and tie mm -hmm. with it. But um, when finishing brush flies where there's a brush on the head, that power pro does do a really nice job of forcing your bucktail to lay back for that profile. So that's good knowledge. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll hmm, go, no, ahead. go ahead. I, I was just going to, you go ahead. I can add color after. So the other thing I'm going to mention too before I start tying because I already know that there'll be comments about this. I'm 100% self-taught fly tire. So it's going to look like I'm tying in reverse. <laughs> like the way I wrap my thread is the complete opposite of what everyone else does, apparently. I never even knew that until I started tying in front of a, a group of people. And one of the people there ended up mentioning that it's weird that I tie in reverse and it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I actually really like that. Uh, one, of the, one of the recurring themes we've talked about here is that there is like a tying theory, right? Like everybody do it this way. And then for every person that does it that way, you find a person that is self-taught and does it differently or has a different mm -hmm. thing that has worked well. And for whatever reason, um, all that to say, there really are 
very few wrong ways to do anything. Um, and most of it is personal preference and experimentation yeah. and mixing it up is great. I was going to add one thing before you jump in here. And that's for anyone who says, oh, he's using 200 GSP and not braid on his own flies. Um, 200 GSP is, in my opinion, overkill in some regards. There's nothing wrong yes. with using it, but I, I use standard 210 flat waxed, uh, either nylon or like Flymaster Plus. First of all, I did here is I just started my thread. I'm just going to clip off that tag end. If it goes in the garbage, there we go. So the first part of this, the tail itself, all it is is a uh, flash boo, and I'm just using the holographic orange. And the reason for the holographic stuff, besides, you know, it adds a little bit more sparkle, the holographic stuff is a little stiffer compared to normal flash boo. And the reason I like that is it follows less around on the hook. I've tried, you know, experimenting with uh, normal uh, flash boo, but I always ran into that issue. So one trick I'm going to show you guys here quick is a lot of people, I'm not going to do it because otherwise it's going to mess up my stuff. So a lot of people just rip off this uh, plastic coating on here. And once that's happening in my experience is if you throw it in just your bag for tying, it's going to become a tangled mess and eventually become useless. So what I actually do here, I cut a little slit just at the top of the bag. So I, all I do is I take my scissors, poke it inside here, and pull out exactly what I need for the amount of material. So like that. And I'm gonna ask you a question just while you're yeah. cutting that out and while you're getting ready to tie it in. Uh, do you, I remember seeing a, a Paul Monaghan video and, and for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Paul is one of the OGs in, in, in our space. Uh, he is a phenomenal tire. He's over uh, in the UK across the pond. Um, but what Paul likes to do is when he ties in um, flash and some of his flash tail flies, he will put glue uh, in the first quarter to half an inch of flash to keep it from fouling. Is that something you ever do? I've experimented with that too. And there are certain pat patterns where I will do that. And it is an awesome, like I would, I would use it a lot more of a jerk style fly where they're darting side to side. Well, this one, it darts side to side a little bit, but not enough that the flash really tangles around the hook that often. Perfect. So because this is a jig fly and the flash is going to be doing one of these, which has a lot less of a propensity to spin around the shank, um, yep. as opposed to like on a glide fly, which, you know, if you're from a gear background at all, it's these completely stiff as a board flies that move or uh, lures that move incredibly. Um, so you, when the fly is, has a tendency to go like this, you probably, that's what you're saying. You, you would be more inclined to keep it from fouling. Yep, exactly. And the other Good. thing that helps too is, uh, it won't be happening on this fly. Some other patterns of mine too, to help prevent fouling is I'll tie on the bug tail, you know, for say if I'm tying a Buford, Tying the bug tail, then I tie on the flash next. Then I put on the two pairs of um, feathers. Those feathers kind of act as a anti-tangle element. Between the bucktail and the feathers, it keeps kind of everything out of trouble. Yes. Yeah. And for how much flash I use on the tail, but it's uh, around about... 40 uh, flash hairs, if I had to give a estimate. So uh, a healthy amount. You're not too worried about it. Yeah. Perfect. Like the flash is the only part of the tail in here. And it looks like just for our audience, it looks like we've got a little bit of signal uh, challenges, we'll call them, just with Wi-Fi. Yes. Uh, they Justin got hammered in snow today. Uh, so if, if we find any audio cutting out and – you know, you see where his lips are moving and you hear audio from me or, or you know, something looks like it maybe isn't exactly lined up. Uh, that would be why, but we definitely want to make sure that, you know, our, our audience and our viewers are getting uh, as much out of these as we can. So this is a full length of the flash boot here. What I like to do is I cut off about another inch and I'm going to cut that right out in the garbage can because I never use a full length on this fly. And this just helps eliminate some mess. Another thing that does is it makes sure all the ends are nice and even as well. Then the way I do this is 
uh, how do I want to word it here? It's going to be two thirds tight, and I'm going to have roughly about a third up towards the eye of the hook. And the reason for that is once I tie this in, I'm going to tie that back over itself. And this is all going on right at the bend of the hook as well. So once that's done, I'm going to take the stuff towards the eye of the hook back over itself. So I'm going to tie that down. And there the tail is essentially done. I want to add just a little bit of color here. Uh, mm -hmm. I noticed that you cut your flash so that all the ends are even. Uh, in some of our other videos, you'll notice that uh, some guys uh, and some tires will like to taper the ends of their flash so that everything's kind of at a, a different level, right? Um, all that to say, whatever your preference is, you know, it really doesn't yeah. matter that much. It, it's it, so what you want to do. Yeah, exactly. And Justin proves, Justin, again, catches some of the biggest muskies in Wisconsin. Uh, on a, Routine's the wrong word, but <laughs> I would say Justin catches more big muskies on a fly rod than almost anyone, if anyone else in our craft. So, yeah, go keep doing your thing, man. Yep, of course. And the reason on most of my patterns, I taper my flash as well too. For this one, since it is only the flash out the rear end, I like to have that third that we afforded towards the front is essentially the taper, if we want to word it that way for this fly. And it just helps add to the anti fouling part of it. So you feel like having all the ends together, like you feel like it kind of stiffens everything up a little bit? Yep, just a little bit since, you know, if I had feathers or anything like that else on here, I would probably taper it. But since it's just pure flash, this is the way I prefer to do it. And if somebody's anyone watching this video wants to tie this pattern with feathers, uh, feel free. Like, don't feel like yes. just because, you know, you see Justin doing it this way. If you want to try something else, definitely you should. Uh, mm -hmm. variety, variety is what it's about when we tie. So keep going. Then another version of this fly too, I use those, um, have tried using those uh, dragon tails. Yeah, yeah. Like the Pacchiarini's? Yes. It, how'd you like I've those? I've used those and that's uh, awesome. How do I want to word it? It's something different that you can do as well. Yeah. What I've noticed, what it does to a fly, it does create a more of a jig style fly. When it's tied this way on the strip, it would dart side to side. Except as soon as you kill it, it dives. So this does the walk and jig at the same time. Yep. Perfect. That's my favorite type of jig flies. And I found with those tails, it pretty much just turns into a straight, normal uh, jig fly. Which those are awesome too. It all depends on the situation. Yeah, like a low visibility situation. Maybe you want more vibration and that's when a tail would come into play. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Then the one thing you're going to see me do throughout this entire process, I'm a huge fan of super glue. So after every time I tie something on, I put a thing of super glue down. It just increases the durability tenfold. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we currently in my truck, I have one of these flies that's caught in 17 fish and it's still together. It probably, a lot of the hair's gone, except all the threads still there holding on. It probably still as, catches fish, right? Oh, it's still what I just permanently retired that one after the last fish it caught. And actually, if you want, I'll finish that kind of story where so the first prototype of this, next day, my, me and my buddy Mike went out. He had the only one of these on his rod. And we went to this spot we call Mike's Hole nowadays because of this. His first cast in, the, in there, Muskie explodes on it and misses. From his point of view, he doesn't hear anything I'm saying. From my point of view, I'm barking orders, get it back in there, get it back in there, because he immediately trout set. I'm going <laughs> so to have to add a line out. You, you got to keep going with the story in a second, but I have to add yeah. one thing. So when Justin and I fished together, 
Justin's one of the easier going folks I, I fished with too. Like we had a really good time, like pleasant conversation. Just, it was a blast the whole time. Uh, we fished on a couple different days and it, it was, it was a treat. Um, but there were a couple moments where we had big fish swing and miss and Justin goes from zero to a million miles an hour. Like, you know, there, there is not child safe language that comes out quickly. And so when he's talking about barking orders, I just want to properly set the stage. Uh, there's some intensity involved at this point in the story. So, you know, he literally didn't ha hear anything I was saying to him. Because honestly, me and Mike are probably, how do I want to word it here? Mike is one of the deadlier musky fishermen I've ever met. And he's on a different level with him picking up on the fly rod now. So he immediately knew without me barking orders too, he just locked it back in there on one motion. Thing explodes on it again, boom, fish on, got it in the net. It is a perfect first musk in a pie. It's like a 31, 32. Nutted for him, got a couple pictures, released it. Then it's like, okay, he's got the hang of this. I'll let him keep fishing this spot. I'm going to go down river and fish my uh, big fish hole. Were you waiting or were you in the boat at this point? We were uh, waiting. Awesome. And I just got down to the spot. All of a sudden, I just hear him yell, net. Whip around and sure enough, his rods doubled over. In my process of gunning for the net, I saw the scar on my leg from it. I ended up banging my shin on a rock. Got up there, netted it. It was a little bit of a bigger fish, like a 34 or so. My rod somewhere down the bank and it's starting to get dark. And the last two pictures and I were pictures in the dark. So took a couple of pictures and while he was really holding it to release it, I turned towards his rod and was looking at the plane. I asked him, Hey, do you mind if I do one quick cast with your rod? He said, yeah, sure, go ahead. He's still holding on to his fish. I made one cast and boom, got another fish. That's awesome. <laughs> How, what, any size to it? Oh, that was a similar size. Where it's like a it 34. matters. No, cool. like a 34. That's still awesome, though. The three fish in about 15 minutes, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, the multi-fish in short windows. I mean, there's definitely small eat windows, but catching them like back-to-back -back like that does not happen often. Yep, exactly. That's cool. And that was on the war pig then? Yes, that was the first prototype of it. And since then, I played with it a little bit more and pretty much I ended up started doing this with the tail. That was one of the first things I changed. Besides that, the fly itself really hasn't changed that much since the first prototype. Um, one thing I noticed you're doing, and, and please don't let me slow you up while you're tying. Of course. Um, I noticed that that's not the longest tail on that fly. Uh, no. And that, especially when you're doing articulated patterns, it's yeah. something that I, I think a lot of times you have folks that want to tie with, happen to have some here, who want to tie with, you know, 10 to 14 inch, like super long stuff. And the reality is that that isn't necessarily what you want. Um, this is this, this next little line here is kind of geared towards folks who are, are getting into it, but generally speaking, you know, this is probably the longest you're going to use on an articulated pattern, unless you're tying a, a dedicated fall pattern, uh, six to eight inches out the tail. Um, yeah. So it just, seeing you tying in, you know, maybe a six inch mm -hmm. tail there, a flash. It's a good point for folks who think that, Hey, I need the longest feathers I can get and the longest bucktail I can get. Like, don't get me wrong. There's definitely value to having really yeah. high quality materials, but high quality may just mean, you know, nice, consistent crinkle, uh, a little bit of hollow in the base. So it helps you hold a profile, um, to really find tips. But beyond that, uh, don't feel like you need to have, you know, nine inch bucktail, which, you know, I, I don't know if there's actually such thing. I, I've never seen it. If there is definitely not in black. Um, I got one. Oh, you one. son of a gun. <laughs> so going on what you were saying. So this is some of my hand collected bucktail that I've done myself. All this pattern, this whole buck uh, end here is only for war pigs. The hair itself is only about 
three and a half inches long and that's it. But what's key to this fly is using bucktail that has a lot of flair to it. And, and what he's describing flair folks, especially if you're still getting into to tying and learning about material selection is having hollow in the bases of bucktail. Um, that hollow, when you cinch it, make, you know, the harder you cinch it, the more it goes like this. That's why if you're tying, you know, a smaller pattern like clousers, you're going to want, you know, you can get away with pretty stiff bucktail if you want, but you mostly want something that doesn't have hollow um, so that when you cinch down on it, it still kind of keeps that stick profile. Um, so yeah, is, is anything to add to that, Justin? Honestly, that was perfect. <laughs> so with my bucktail that I currently have, I literally have a bin, you know, a huge bin of it, except they each have a purpose. There's no such thing as a bad bucktail, except it limits some of its purposes sometimes. How do you like to use different types of bucktail in different applications? I think this is almost as valuable, sure. if not more so, than the actual tying, which we'll, we'll definitely get to. So, for example, here, like with this very uh, hollow stuff here, this stuff I love for warping adds a little bit of uh, buoyancy to the fly itself. So this stuff here is the perfect length for uh, tying Buford heads. And it's a perfect density for tying Buford heads. Because I personally do not like um, using actual deer hair for Buford heads. Everyone has their own opinion about that, but I that's agree with my, that. this is the stuff I prefer for doing my own Buford style heads. Then like with the longer, trying to see if I got any red, well, that's a little bit longer. And we're going to do, you know, this will be a little bit of extra uh, instruction. I'm not sure if we'll cut this and add it in when we do our Buford section, but yeah, um, I'm going to just share a little bit of when I'm tying a Buford head and, and please add oh, any and all to this that you want. But when you're tying a, a, a single Buford, you know, like a single Buford on a single hook, um, the way I like to do it is I will start with the longest bucktail in the tail. Um, you know, I'll decide how long I fly to be, and then I'll yep. say, okay, I want the feathers to go to here. And then I'll say, I want the bucktail to go. So I have a few inches of feathers sticking out, but then I'll shorten the bucktail and I'll build that taper. And when you get to the head and it's time to do that Buford head. And I think this is what Justin was just alluding to. Uh, you don't necessarily, if you're using deer hair, that's, you know, at most a year, an inch and a half, usually around an inch long, um, your taper kind of looks weird. Like, you, you know, you don't get that natural bait fish taper, even in a, a Buford. Um, I personally, what I like to do is I'll try to find Buford, uh, bucktail, pardon me, with some hollow up maybe the first third or so of it that's in that like two to three inch range, two and a half inch range. Um, two is even fine sometimes uh, for a smaller one. But then when you cinch down on the Buford head, you try to use the longer side of that bucktail uh, to kind of continue your taper so that when you flare the other part of the mm -hmm. bucktail, you've got kind of that still teardrop shape. Yes. Is that what you were saying when you were talking about, you know, using longer, this is perfect Buford length. Is that what you meant? Yep, that's exactly what I mean. And I mean, deer hair does work on, I would say, smaller Buford flies, you know, on ones that or like four inches long. They're perfect for that. What it is is learning your bug tail and any material for the flies you're tying and what suits you. Everyone is a little bit different. So everyone has their own opinions about this stuff. And there's some trial and error, right? Like you have to figure out yes. what you like as you tie more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I remember when I first started tying musky flies, you know, 10 plus years ago, I was trying to use this stuff here for trying to make the Buford head. Where it's a little bit hollow, so it wouldn't actually flare up into a nice head. Well, and then it messes your head, gets gappy, and it doesn't work like you want yes. it to. Yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly. Unfortunately, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, we've all been through that. It's a lot all of us have, yeah, it, or or will if you haven't. Yes. Yet. Yeah. And the thing is, if the fly doesn't look that great either, the fish don't care. The fish don't judge your tying. I've no, seen once it's some in the water and you're fishing it. They really, I mean, have you ever seen like some of the best flies you tie on the vice? You're like, this thing looks incredible. And you fish it and you take it and you throw it in your box or whatever. And you pull it out later and you're like, oh my God, this thing looks terrible. And it's still fishy. Yeah. Like one of my buddy Ian's uh, 
he attempted to tie just a single bufer and it turned out for a first bufer it turned out decent and he i forget the name it was ugly something he ended up catching the first musky on it so oh, fish don't care it wasn't that ugly <laughs> yeah exactly and it was in some weird colors too i never would use either so yeah my next step here I, uh, I like the Zappagap stuff, whether this is just a normal Zappagap. Otherwise, I do like, for the gel stuff I have found, I do like the Gorilla glue, uh, Super Glue and Gel. And then both gel and the normal Super Glue have a time and a place. Like, I like using the gel a lot for attaching eyes, which we'll be doing on this fly. Except for... This stuff I want to penetrate into the thread and into the material. I like using the more liquidy stuff. Is that that's the Zappa Gap green? Yep. So just put a little drop on there, and I with the uh, Renzetti bias, I can turn the head around so I can make sure the glue is on all sides. And you remind me, you said that was a four out uh, attitude. Four out, uh, attitude extra. Perfect. And then what, what vice are you using there? Just uh, how to, This is the uh, Regal. I'm forgetting the name of the head. I think it's a monster head. Because for my personal tie-in, I'm not a big fan of true rotary. Except some people love rotary and it just isn't for me. You, so you're talking to one. What is, uh, what is your reason? Like, what is your, what is your preference? What, what makes that your preference? For me, I'm mostly tying... These days, it's very rare if I trout fish. <laughs> and if I do, it's at times streamers mostly. So what I found for rotary vice are nicer for smaller flies in my experience. I know there's uh, plenty of guys out there that'll disagree with that, that love rotary for musky flies. But for me, I know what I'm doing. So I just like to be able to look at all sides. So I just like the head to be able to turn. Well, and you and, and that's a, hmm? sorry. Keep going. I mean, to cut you off. Please keep going. Yep. So that's why I prefer just a standard regal vice versus a rotary. So back to the time here. One step. All I did here is I clipped off a uh, hair from the bucktail here. One thing that is key. So I clipped it off, and you'll see there's all these little stragglers here. What I do is. You can use a comb, but I prefer, I don't like a ton of tools on my desk. I just hand pick it all out over the trash can and just pick out all those short hairs, any of the strays. And, and, so gonna, that, and, and while you're doing that, I'm going to grab and just show one other way that you can do that. I have a couple clumps of bucktail that have, yeah, that I've ended up tying for a pattern or, or maybe I wasn't paying attention and, and I did it extra. But if you, you know, what he's saying is you can actually hold, you know, the longer parts pretty tight and you can pull the short hairs out. You'll see a couple little fall there. Mm -hmm. um, and you also can flick it and the guard hairs will like come out of there. Um, but that, that was what Justin was saying. It, I, and I'm doing this just in case there's any uh, Wi-Fi issues that make that hard to see. Keep yeah. So then what I'm going to be start doing here is what's called reverse tying. So what I mean by that, the butt end of the bucktail is going to be facing the tail end of the fly and the tips will be facing the eye of the hook and when this, i do this for multiple reasons the first one would be it builds up uh, durability and it also causes the fly to have a little it creates the illusion of bulk is what this does and what i like to do with this fly i move just ahead of where i tied in the flash there and I line up the butt, end of the bucktail up with where my, where my thread ends I, at the bend of the hook there. Hold that tight. And one thing I'll explain why I'm spinning my bobbin is it just adds a little more strength and also allows it to spin a little bit nice, more nicely than if it was just flat. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is just do two loose wraps. Then I'm going to start to tighten the thread down and you can help it along and it'll spin around the hook like that. Then I'll throw a few more wraps down like that, nice and tight. And 
for myself, I don't own any special tool for this. Those uh, tools from, yep, the Prologen and the and Minnesota. Those and are you, nice. You get options, and and if you don't, if if you know, again, a lot of folks that want to get into this are either you know some some folks are still in high school want to get into this or or have kids and want to get into don't want to spend extra money because you know that's just the way it is sometimes. You can hollow out an old Bic pen. I like the clear one because you can still see your material inside. Um, you tie in a lot of jig hooks, you know, and you kind of incrementally work your way up. This is a Proto John. Uh, it's a dedicated tool. It's got a groove in it. I love this one for jig hooks. Uh, and, you know, you find yourself doing a lot of this and, you know, eventually you'll have way more stuff than you ever need. You know, when you do start spinning a lot of, of bucktail and uh, doing work with it, you know, th these tools, these are awesome. Uh, these are the mm -hmm. Minnesota fly tools and they come with, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get my sizes right just for the sake of illustration. And they also have this packing tool. So um, we're going to do some deer hair work later on in this series, but when you spin similar to the way Justin just did reverse, but deer hair is a little bit different. Um, this tool ends up actually helping you compress all that hair together. And anyone who's seen deer hair work, you know, you're, you're creating things that look like frogs and stuff out of hair. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, keep on going. I digress. It's easy for yep. me to go pretty hard into this stuff at any time. Well, I totally understand. I was hoping you would on that one because for me personally, I'm a minimalist, so I don't like having a lot of tools, but the, that that is such a They're nice really feature. nice. So for me, since I don't like using tools mostly, all I do is I start kind of pushing the hair back over itself, so it's facing the tail of the fly. I usually start with my right hand, and just so it kind of gets a start, and it starts to go back on itself a little bit, then I take my and I pull it all back, so then I can use my right pull the thread forward. Then what I'm going to do is start to create this thread dam that's going to cause the, flat, the bucktail to do is lay back further and further. So you can adjust how uh, wide you want the fly to be. This one I like to keep a little bit slimmer, say right about there. So say if you wanted the widest fly you can get depending on your bucktail, you could leave it right there if you wanted to. So for my purposes with this fly, I like to uh, create my taper this way. And this is always the most time consuming process of tying any musky flies building that dam. You know, the, the more of these videos we've done, we've, we've done, a, we've already recorded a bunch of these at this point and, you know, we haven't decided exactly what order they're gonna air in yet, uh, but, it's interesting um, just to see the difference in everyone's uh, reverse tying technique. And, and again, I like the way you're tying a thread dam there and not tying back on your bucktail and letting it do <laughs> Then here's why I like just being able to turn the jaws around from, I think that angle there, you can see this side is a little more out a little bit. And that's why I like being able to turn the vise. So that way I can go back on top of it so when you were saying earlier, when you were saying earlier, you don't like a necessarily a rotary vice. You weren't saying you don't necessarily like the ability to turn your vice. Agreed. Yep, that's exactly you, what I mean. You are referring more to not necessarily needing a true rotary. Yes. Cool. Being able to turn my vice like that allows me to see the fly, you know, fly from all angles without having to take it off the vice at all. Because you know, when I first started, that's what I was forced to do, and you know, as a beginner, you can expect the, uh, oh, what would be a nice term for it? The madness that ensued of taking my hook off the vise. So the whole tail of this fly, all it is is the flash, and it's going to be three bunches of this bucktail. And the bucktail, each bunch is roughly about the thickness of a pencil, roughly. And do you get a little bit, do you get a little bit, uh, longer with each bunch of bucktail or what, what is on it? On this one, I keep it all very, there's a very, very slight taper to it. Like here's a finished tail here. Of course, this kind of mashed up because it was sitting in a bag, but you can kind of see that there is a very slight taper to it. There isn't a ton of taper in that bucktail at all. So you don't really slip that back too far on your reverse tie there then, huh? What's that? 
you don't necessarily, you know, I know that some of my reverse ties, especially the first one, um, is pretty mm-hmm. steep. You know, it, it's not necessary. It's barely a yeah. reverse tie. You, you're not, you're already starting to build your profile there, huh? And the reason for that is, once again, this gets to the anti-tangling issue of the flash. I like having it up a little bit because uh, the bucktail itself kind of acts as a anti-tangling agent. Two, once you fish this, you know, a couple of days or even one day, start to taper down more and more on his other water. As as kind of the wear of stripping bends it back. Yep. Um, yep, exactly. L- let me ask you this, and, and this is just for the sake of, you know, anyone watching who's maybe not worked with a ton of bucktail. Mm-hmm. If, uh, if I were tying that fly and I never tied it before and I'm doing my thread dam and maybe my angle of my bucktails a little wider or a little narrower, would you think twice about it or would you just keep tying and keep spinning and finish the fly? Most of the time, no. Perfect. Because sometimes it can create a unique action to that fly, if that makes sense. <laughs> it may or may not end up being a good thing, but if you have unlimited flies with slightly different actions, you're going to end up with some winners in there, right? Yep, Exactly. Because I'm a firm believer in, my opinion is color doesn't matter. That's just my opinion. I'm a bigger a proponent of um, having multiple different styled flies because they each have a time and a place. So, says the guy who catch all catches all of his giants on black and orange. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Pretty much. <laughs> No, but still, I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. sure whatever you'd be fishing, I'm sure it would get eaten. You just have confidence on something and you use it. Exactly. Um, quite a few seasons ago, I spent uh, a whole season not fishing my confidence color, black and orange, just to prove a point to myself and my buddies that color really doesn't matter that often. I would put action above profile in a lot of cases. Yeah. yeah. Has their own opinion. Like I'm a... Like, this is just a theory of mine, and this is the theory on the advancement of a musky angler, whether it's with fly or with, or with gear. My theory is, at the beginner, you know nothing. You're learning, still trying to figure out what these fish do. Stage two would be, I know everything. These fish will be doing this, this, this on that level. Let me know how long that lasts. Yep, then there's stage three, I know nothing. They make their own rules. Like one of the fisheries I fish, it tends to be, they like this like this, except this year with a decent fish on a 14 inch fly. Did you so say they like smaller stuff typically? Yep, on that fishery. Sorry, you cut out for a second. I just wanted to make yep. sure. Yep, on that fishery, they tend to like the smaller stuff, but we caught a fish on a 14 inch fly this year on there. They make their own rules. Or, or was that a red horse pattern or what was that? That was a, yep, red horse. Was it a jiggy fly? Was it a profile fly? It was the uh, hillbilly deluxe. So it's kind of a jiggy glide profile. Fly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. that pattern. I do too, for, you know, look at my pictures, obvious reasons. <laughs> and, you know, that's just, once again, my theory on, you know, I'm at the point where I know nothing. They make their own rules. You just have to figure them out that day. That, that's a very humble uh, assessment of your talents. He knows more than nothing. I'm going to put that out there. Um, and actually, <laughs> Justin was one. Justin actually literally placed the first order on our website when muskytown.com launched. And uh, the reason I bring that up is because one of the things that's been important to us has been building a community that is diverse and inclusive and um, not necessarily made up of the old guard. And there's a reason for that, uh, that, that diversity of background and um, skill level preference, you know, locale, it ultimately ends up having a, a different perspective that is valuable. And, and, you know, when you have a conversation be- between people of different tying and fishing levels, all of us grow as anglers. So um, w- w- you'll hear kind of a, a consistent theme of inclusivity when we talk about tying and fishing. And there's a reason for that. And it's because it makes us all better, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this if you are, but we're not all just fish bumps. 
like, you know, we have families and we are, yeah. and we're approachable. So if there's things you want to learn, whether that's about fishing or tying or any number of different facets of our sport, ask, because, uh, you know, if you don't ask, you, you may figure it out at some point, but if you do ask, no matter how self-conscious you are about a given question, you're going to learn that much faster. And in yes. this sport where you have limited opportunities, um, that has a lot of value. And like kind of going on, um, no matter what you're always learning. Like uh, when back when I was guiding, I had a client, I still remember this moment <laughs> where it's easier to show him than describe what he did. So he ended up doing this little movement with his rod. And my immediate reaction is, was, wait, how the, did you do that? What was, uh, <laughs> what, what was the context of that? What was the, the movement? Was it a, was Honestly, it a retrieve technique or was it a, in the Yeah, he just did something a little bit different while he was retrieving his fly. And I knew this fly very well, like it was one I tied three or four weeks before that trip. So I knew what I was supposed to do in the water. When he did this movement, it made it that fly do something completely different. And I liked it. It's like a well-timed twitch or something like that? Yeah. Cool. It's like, you know, you're always learning. <laughs> That's kind yeah. of what I'm getting at there. Yeah, I think your point on stage three, no matter how far you get into this craft, if if you never ask that question, you may never learn. Yes. Do you count your wraps at all? Are you a wrap ca- counter? Honestly, no. It's more of a trout thing, right? You know, I just, literally, I just judge based on what I feel. Sometimes it's five wraps, sometimes it's more or less. I've never been a thread counter. The only... Take that back. That's a lie. On certain flies, I will count, except that would be if I'm tying a classic salmon fly kind of thing. We don't do that. No. (laughs) There's plenty of people who do that. We don't do that. (laughs) Salmon are awesome. Don't get me wrong. I just, first time I like ever, I like carp is as small as I go. You tie on like a size 10 or 12 and things start to get a little tricky to see. And you're like, nah, I don't, I don't want to go smaller than this. It's too much. <laughs> yeah, that was a huge phase. And I still have a lot of that stuff though, which I, I'm holding it to work now to see if I decided to tie another one, but the amount of money I invested in tying like five flies was ridiculous. <laughs> Either I was 12 or I just turned 13 when I started tying. For and, and Justin wouldn't tell you this himself, so I will for you. Uh, yeah. Justin, Justin fishes both gear and fly. Uh, but unlike most who will come from a gear background and then get into fly, which is, uh, I think, a pretty common evolution. Uh, yep, I agree with that. Justin started on fly. Uh, and, and he did gear too, but... I don't know if I've met any other folks that you are a, a substantially better angler on fly than, than gear, correct? You're more confident with I'll, that? I'll fully admit I suck up gear. <laughs> like, I'll fully admit. He says, and how many how many over 50-inch fish did you catch on gear this year? You don't want to know. <laughs> you <laughs> really sucks. don't want to know. It sucks, though. <laughs> <laughs> like, comparatively, I have a lot more confidence in throwing a fly versus throwing the gear rod. And... I've only been doing the gear thing seriously for just over a year and that's it. Oh, I didn't realize it was that, uh, that short a period of time. I thought you'd been doing it longer. No, that's awesome. Like back, I started musky fly fishing back when I was, I want to say 14 is when I started fly fishing for musky. And I started out, I got involved with a group called Musky Zinc. There was one small chapter where I lived. So they kind of got me in the ropes and I bought a cheap rod and a cheap rod reel. And I did that for like half a year. So that was also the point where I was starting to get really serious in the fly fishing. So I got the, let's just face it, it's still a crazy idea of fly fishing for musky. 
So it's like, you know what? I'm going to to throw the gear anymore. I'm going to start throwing the fly. We lack sanity. This is true. Yep, exactly. So, you know, started throwing the fly. And it took me quite a few years for me to get my first assist because there wasn't that many options out there to learn. I was using essentially pike flies, which do work sometimes, trying to use them for muskie. But there's definitely a difference. Yes. Unless you're fishing for like European pike. Yep, I agree. Based on the videos I've seen. God, they get so big. Do you follow uh, Paolo Pacchierini? Oh, yeah. And you got pa- Paolo catches 50 inch plus pike, like, it, like it's his job. Um, we caught that. Was it this year or last year? He caught that. What was it? A uh, 55, 56 incher? Yeah, I remember the fish. It was something crazy. It's still one of the largest pike I've ever. Yeah. So the one thing I'm going to do here, since I don't like tools, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you guys how I do a a finger uh, half hatch. And it's a lot easier to uh, show. How do I describe it? It's easier to show than to describe what I'm doing. So I'm going to try and do this from a couple angles. And honestly, you can do as many as you want to. I always finish with super glue. And quite honestly, I know plenty of guys that don't even tie knots anymore. They just put super glue on their thread and wrap and they're done. That, that's crazy talk. I, I, I hand whip and I'll do like, you know, a couple of threes <laughs> or fours at minimum. I, I feel like I built you up enough, so don't let this go to your head. But I am going to ask, you caught a pretty big pike this year, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah for... like 35 inches or, or how big? <laughs> well there's a behind what you said there's a wholly different story behind that <laughs> honestly this year was my big pike year back home where i'm originally from i was spoiled with pike and up until a fish i caught the muskie i caught a uh, year ago december it took up it you know this long i caught that pike back when i was 15 so it took 12 years to catch a muskie bigger than my biggest pike ever. The river I grew up fishing spoiled me with a lot of 40 to 48 eight inch class pike, including I caught a 52 inch pike on that river back home. But this past summer, through the years of uh, muskie fishing, I kind of lost my love for pike a little bit. So this year I kind of gained it back again. I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> I found my uh, a nice fishery here that produces a lot of big pike. And to the point where, while I was laughing at that story, was uh, me and a couple of buddies were fishing. And this was a musky spot. This should have been a musky. Fish blew up on uh, glide bait. Fought like a musky guy beside the boat. And here was like a... 40 to 42 inch class inch pike. I was so mad that I told my buddies just unhook it, get that thing off my blank line now. <laughs> Except the uh, pike he, Adam's referring to right now, um, I got very fortunate and probably caught the biggest pike I'll ever catch here in this state. And I highly, you know, I could prove myself wrong and catch one this spring bigger. I hope but you do. I really hope you do. Is it, you know, is it possible? Yes, but. How, how, how big was that pike? I, I know it was uh, 48. So, 48 for inch pike. so this is the part where it, it, it's better if I tell the rest of this. Uh, when Justin caught this fish, he was by himself. And just so anybody who doesn't know Justin, um, when he catches gear fish, he gives it up to whoever made the lure for that fish. Like he's very, very forward with it, whether that was a, a gear or a fly caught fish. And uh, one of the things that I respect about Justin the most is that uh, he prioritizes the safety and health of the fish over chicken grin, which is not something that is entirely pervasive in our sport, as much as I wish that it was. Um, practicing good catch and release tactics and being an ethical, sustainable angler for the you know benefit of future generations is important. And Justin 
took this picture of the fish and, and, and anyone who's caught a giant fish like this, your adrenaline pumps, like you're not thinking clearly. Like it just like, let's get that. That's it's an important part of this story. Uh, so Justin catches this fish, gets it out of the net, puts it on the bump board, says, all right, we got to get this thing back in. And he releases it and then goes, oh my God, what did I just do? It was a, you know, it was a state record it, like by, by a couple inches, right? Yep, um, the current catch and release state record is 46. So by, by two plus inches, it was the state record pike in the state of Wisconsin this year, which I think is pretty special and, and deserves a little bit of extra credit. So, yeah. And kind of the funny part is I didn't even know it would, would have been the state record either. It wasn't until, you know, released all that, called the girlfriend and was telling her, yeah, I caught a giant fish, caught a 40 inch pike. She immediately hung up on me. Because here she was on Google, Googling the state record, and she immediately calls me back and said, hey, did you take this picture? It's like, no, why? Because anyone, anyone who's thinking clearly in that moment is like, oh, my God, what did I just do? Um, <laughs> but no, nah, that, that I mean, hey, congratulations, though. Seriously, that, that was really cool. <laughs> and honestly, it's still one of the prettiest pike I've ever caught, too. Oh. Beautiful. You know what we'll do when, when we share this video? We'll, we'll cut the picture of the pike over the top of yeah. it. Yeah, and and you cut that on like a, a seven inch fly, six inch fly, right? That was on the uh, magic bullet, so it was about six, seven inches. That's, I mean, that's awesome. We'll do. Uh, we we weren't sure we were gonna roll out the magic bullet, and we're still not sure yet. So we may or may not end up doing a tying video on that pattern this year. We may end up saving it for next year. Yeah. But, uh, uh, a really, really fishy pattern that works on everything from big smallies to giant muskies. Um, really great early season fly. We'll just it say. is great. Yeah. yeah. Well, even that, um, I forget how big this fish was, but that big one I caught the middle of summer was on a magic bullet too. And that was a trophy class inch muskie on a, you know, air quote, small six inch, seven inch fly. Mm -hmm. hard to call that luck when you do it at the frequency that you do what it is is i'll fully admit it's just time on the water and willing to do how do i want to word it willing to push your equipment to their absolute limit how many uh how many times have you banged your prop outboard on rocks in water skinny enough that you shouldn't have been there more than a care to admit that which we had some major flooding around here this fall and here was a new deadhead I didn't know about. Uh, last day of fishing out of the boat, you know, brand new deadhead. I had no clue about it. I ended up smoking that thing. <laughs> like that one actually made me nervous. It happens sometimes. <laughs> yep. So it was normally an area where I can just full throttle and I didn't think about it. Do you run now? Do you run a you? I know you run an outboard. Uh, I think it's a two stroke. Do you run a shear pin in your rig or what? What do you do? Oh, uh, sorry. What was that again? Does your uh, does your outboard have a shear pin in the prop? No. What What do you feel like would happen if you did? Oh, if I did, I'd be losing props left and right. <laughs> Honestly. So you kind of. Uh, I, I'm asking this is a little bit of a leading question, but you're mm -hmm. you're prioritizing. You know, if you do eventually hit something hard enough you're going to pretty much like you're risking your lower unit for the sake yep. of the ability to get into water that others can't with a prop. Yes. Cool. Just, I, I wanted to make sure that we were pretty explicit about that because if you are going to take a boat, that's, you know, either a, a flat bottom V with a prop into really skinny water. Um, if you're in a, in a position to run a jet, uh, you, you very much may want to. Um, and yes. If, and if you're not go really slowly. <laughs> yeah. That are like on a couple of lake systems of fish, they're connected by, we'll call them ditches. The only way to get to them is my buddy Ben would hop out and drag the boat behind him. That's the only way to get to a couple of the lakes I fish, where the water's so skinny I can't even run my trolling motor for that matter. I mean, I remember, you know, when we fished together, we were at a crawl, like minimum, minimum forward throttle. Um, Essing through what would you say 18 inches of water at most um it was less than a it would have been less than a foot of water because i had the uh motor raised so all that to say if you see a, a bunch of water that you think that you know maybe the 
the holy grail is on the other side of it go slow like don't go damaging your equipment but what's the point of kind of pushing you know like i I, I'm absolved of all liability that you do what you want at your own risk, but yep. the only way to become a better angler and to catch these fish is to try something that anyone else hasn't done yet or hasn't done with any frequency or hasn't done publicly. Like that's the stuff where maybe, you know, in a public forum, if you put out in public comments, you mm -hmm. may not get the answer for, and you may, you know, and we're not going to tell you where to go by any means, but no, just because the, you know, you got to earn your way there. Like you, you really do. Yeah. But, but if you're talking about techniques and you're talking about drop-offs and like generalizations about stuff as you're learning, um, ask those questions. So one thing while I'm throwing the shank on, so on the big game shanks, you're going to see, see if I can kind of show you, there's a smaller loop and then there's a bigger loop. You can kind of see the size difference. You can see it better in person. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I think it's a good point. Um, there's there's one end is a little bit bigger than the other end. Yes. And for me, I personally like taking the bigger end and then attaching that to the hook. As do I. I, I agree with that. Because it allows that hook a little more freedom to move. So the one little key part is for when I'm putting this on, I'm going to flip this fly over, put the big loop through the eye of the hook like that. And in a moment, you'll see why I did that here. So this fly rides hook up. And the way this fly is designed, all the magic's in the front of the fly. So what you're going to end up seeing is everything here has been measured to the exact, from the rattles I'm about to use to the eyes I'm about to use. You got rattles in there? Yeah. Oh, baby, let's go. It all it's right here in this gap right between the that I'll tag in there okay and there's times where i'll take my nipex and even shorten that up if needed and if for anyone who's wondering um nipex i'm going to go ahead and pull these mm -hmm. out here uh we're going to be offering these uh soon we're already working on it just because there's really no replacement um, these, we use these for everything from shortening wire to cutting, you know, every once in a while you'll have a hook that in a fish is, is near the gills and in prioritizing, uh, you know, catch and release tactics mm -hmm. and making sure for sustainable fishing that fish live, um, you don't, you don't like tear that hook out because when a, when a hook gets in that situation, like you're going to kill the fish if you do that. Uh, so what you do is uh, very carefully, um, you'll actually will go in at times from the gill side, being very careful mm -hmm. not to touch the gills. You have to avoid the, the, the red gills because you can very much lethally damage a fish if you're not careful. I mean, hold that fish tight. And if they start shaking, get the, you know, get the cutters out of there, but you go in and you'll clip that hook point out and then you'll pull it out and the, the fish will pass that hook point. It'll dissolve over time mm -hmm. and the fish will be okay. But if you're, you know, going in through the mouth with long pliers and trying to get too crazy, you know, if you find yourself in that situation where the hook doesn't come out and it happens sometimes, like, don't yes. get me wrong. Like you'll see blood in some pictures and it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's still, it's a blood sport. Um, mm -hmm. Cut that hook. You can always tie another fly. You can't replace a fish that's 20 plus years old and think that yes. you're not going to somehow impact the ecosystem. So uh, I, I think it's a part of our sport that we talk about, but we don't necessarily always talk about the extent of how careful you have to be with these fish. They are fragile and make sure when you do eventually get the hook out or you cut the hook out, take that extra time and revive the fish, sit there and hold it by the tail. Don't be afraid to stick your arm and your shirt in the water and get a hand underneath the belly of that fish. Because if you're able to do it and that fish hasn't swam away already, that fish still needs you to bring it back to life a little bit. Mm -hmm. Think about it. I, I, a lot of us who fish don't get a ton of exercise. We, we, you know, we can carry our freaking 30 bags of groceries at once and be proud of ourselves that we did it in one trip. But then, you know, sometimes we're out of breath after that, or if we just stare at yeah. And so think about a fish that just fought for its life and it's out of breath and you've had this fish out of the water, take that extra time, save the fish, revive it. And then when it's ready to swim away, it'll kick strongly and it'll swim away. Mm -hmm. 
Anything to add to that, Justin? So the one thing I was going to add is you'd be surprised how much time 10 seconds is. So what I mean by that is we've timed myself and multiple of my friends. 10 seconds is a long time for taking pictures and getting it back in the water. Because when we're taking pictures, we're just boom, 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 boom. Because my rule is at least one out of the 100 photos we take in 10 seconds is going to turn out good. Perfect. So you'd say 20 seconds. to 30 seconds is too long. Yes, in my opinion. Like I've heard multiple anglers that I still look up to where they say they have them out of the water for over a minute and they're released fine. That which, you know, this is once again getting into a different opinion that we yeah. all have them. That feels too long though. But push it. Why push it for even getting that close? I mean, not hearing that you think that 10 seconds is too long, like it makes me want to shorten that time. And I've had mm -hmm. times where I've had to revive fish for three, four minutes before they're ready to go. And, and it's not a good feeling when you're not a hundred percent confident that that fish kicked out hard, right? Yes, exactly. And another thing is uh, Jordan Weeks is uh, kind of the head musky biologist here in Wisconsin and trying to remember how he worded it. He's one of the few people, if he speaks, I listen because the amount of time he's dedicated to these fish, studying them in a scientific environment, I listen to about everything he says. And the one thing he said is on a podcast he was on, I think either this year or last year, he said he's a firm believer in as soon as you get the fish back in the water, if it's staying upright, let the fish go. And I did some experimenting with it on this season. You know, unless you're fishing in current where you really can't just let go, this would be situations on a wake or in a, the eddies of the river where you don't really have that much moving water. What his belief is, the longer you hold on to that fish, the more stressed out that fish is getting. So this year I actually spent some time listening to what he said, just as soon as the fish is able to stay upright on its own, let go. All the fish, as soon as they let go, they explode it off. I agree. I agree with that entirely. Um, yep. And for anyone who hasn't or has very little release experience, uh, when you're releasing a fish, and the little ones are actually really challenging to hold the tail of. Mm -hmm. It's worth stating. Like if you, you know, if you're talking like upper 20s to low 30s inch fish. They don't quite have the handlebar like the tail doesn't have room to grab it so don't be afraid to get that extra hand under the fish's belly to give yourself a little bit extra but when you do have that good grip of the fish by the tail and as it's sitting in the water um I, i'm curious if you have anything different to add to this yeah just, but i will rotate the fish and you'll notice when they start to write themselves it, and so in video sometimes that'll look like you're going with this don't do this you'll actually kind of suffocate the fish because you're you're overwhelming their gills and how they take in oxygen but you rotate the fish and the fish will straighten themselves out and there will get to a point where it actually gets kind of challenging to turn the fish and when they're ready you kind of slowly lighten your grip and they'll kick out and they'll go and actually if you want an example of that the uh if you want, I can even give a timestamp if people want to take time to look at it. The last video I posted on Instagram, and I think I did it on Facebook too, there are two release videos of uh, two of my, two of the heaviest fish this year. And that very last one, you can see me turn it a little bit. And as soon as I did that, shot off. That's it's how strongly it was. It strongly disagreed. Yep, and it was gone. That's awesome. <laughs> That's how we'll word it. Cool. Yeah. I, I, is that the one you put uh, music on in, uh, in yep. your, yeah, I love that video. And the thing I love about that video too, just on a different note, I just love that you see the true size of that, that fish They're in so that video. Big. You, like the fish you caught, I like, I can't say it enough. Like, I hope that everyone who's, who's watching this video really takes in the nuances of the stuff that Justin's talking about. High 40s, low 50s inch fish uh, that Justin does. Uh, you don't really, like, if you have a, dis you know, if you disagree with anything that he said, um, please, I want to hear yeah. why. 
um, like send us a note so that we can talk about it because, you know, I think that as a, a craft, we're still pretty early on in, in musky fly fishing, getting big, yeah. uh, the more high level conversation we have like that, the better for the species. Yep. I totally agree. Cause once again, everyone learns things differently and they all have their own, diff- own, their own opinion. And we're all entitled to our own opinions about stuff, except it's sometimes nice to learn why do you do this instead of this, if that makes sense. It does, but I also want to say we're all entitled to our own opinions. We're not entitled to our own facts. It's actually one of my favorite quotes. True. And, and so if you do disagree and you have a different opinion, and I have a different opinion, and you have a different opinion, I don't care if my opinion's right or not. Yeah. If it's wrong, I want to know why. And if mm-hmm. you do submit a question to us, you know, we'll go ahead. We'll reach out to Jordan Weeks and we'll say, hey, mm-hmm. hey, this is this. These are these different opinions that we've heard in this. Like, what do you think is correct? And we'll go to the folks that, you know, the more high level opinions we can get, the better for the future conservation of the, the species. So, again, uh, it's easier for me to digress and talk fish theory like all day long. Um, I, I feel like if we kept going, we'd never let you finish this fly. So <laughs> so thank you for bearing with. Of course. So the other thing I did here with the regal vices, you can bend them up like that and the reason i do that is i found out it's a little bit easier to kind of shank with a regal vice if you do that Mm -hmm. it just frees up a little bit more room versus if i had it down like that i don't get as much room to finagle see that hook starting to get in my way i agree it gets challenging (laughs) sometimes like tying on a, a shank and it jacks up in the articulation and it's not the best reality for tying sometimes Mm Hmm. And that's why, like, if I'm mass producing these, what I do is I actually just have a strand of just any normal wire. I'll go over top of this and wrap it down tight so that hook is always out of my way. Don't have to worry about it either being in my way or even worse, getting hooking myself. And you really, I, I appreciate that you're exaggerating the angle of that vice. I mean, the, the clips are great and everything, but they don't always mm-hmm. work depending on what vice you have. So th- that's good. Yep. Yeah. So that's why, you know, that's why I use wire because the clips don't really work on a wide regal like that. So from here, just going to start the thread again. On the shank and a little tricks that I've learned on the shank here. So the first thing I do is I coat the whole uh, shank in thread. Make sure it's all tight. What I'm going to do is go back to the eye that has a hook in it. What I'm going to do is start to wrap up towards trying to close up this gap a little bit. And what helps do this too is add just a tiny bit of super glue. So that way the thread grabs a little bit more. What I'm doing is trying to close up that eye a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, sometimes you get too much motion if you do that. If you don't do this, it don't the uh, hook has almost too much movement and sometimes foul on itself. Interesting. So I found that if I do this, and I'll take it off here in a second, so you see exactly how much I closed off. Right about there. You're really you're you're exaggerating. You're going up that angles on the shank until it starts to slide back down, right? Yeah, I mean that's that's yep. pretty close. Yeah. And what that does is it helps prevent that from happening where the fly follows on top of itself on the shank. Cool. So I'm even going to add a couple more wraps there to prevent that. And and while you're doing that, I just, I want to add a little bit of uh, yeah. input. Uh, so kind of in line with our, our conversation about how a muskie acts like a lion that hits on the turn at a, a, mm-hmm. a, a bait fish or something it perceives as a bait fish. Uh, Muskie are not typically, there's, there's exceptions, of course, they're typically not tail nipping flies. Like Correct. You, you'll have the rare exceptions where the fish sits there on the tail, feathers at the fly and sits there and flutters its mouth. And you feel like mm-hmm. you hate that fish and it's because that fish is like I said it. Yep, exactly. Uh, but generally when these fish eat, they eat and they're hitting at center mass on a turn fly. So if you... I remember a lot of my early singles, I wasn't exactly like, you know, I didn't have a ton of confidence in a nine inch fly where the hook was at the very front of the fly. So 
what we would do is, you know, I would do a, a similar platform to what Justin's doing, where you'd have a, a hook that was back set into the middle of the fly and a shank in the front of it. Um, all this to say, if you do want to push length, say you're looking for like a, a 10 inch fly, 11 inch fly, but you don't want to have a hook on the very head of the fly for the same reason. Uh, it, it's a really good intermediate solution before you get into three shanked or two hook, one shank flies, uh, actually having, you know, a shank that sets your hook that, that much closer to the middle of the fly. Cause if you think about it, on a, a nine inch fly, the jaws, they're pretty big. I mean, they're going to cut a big fish is going to take every bit of, it, except for maybe a half inch. And when you bring in their gill suck and bring that fly down, the whole fly goes down sometimes. Yep. Um, but there are also exceptions where a fish munches straight in the middle of it and you will see the front and the back of the fly sticking out of the fish's mouth and they just latch on. Um, I, I remember seeing a lot of that back in the live bait days and they'll sit there and they'll hold it like a dog with a bone. So yeah, you do want your hook when a fly gets beyond nine inches, you do want to make sure that your hook is back placed in the middle of the fly somewhere or in the front middle of the fly. Yep, totally agree with that. And to kind of clarify one thing, I'm a firm believer in um, with flies, my hookup ratio is significantly better with flies versus gear. And the reason be, this is once again, my theory is flies are more neutrally buoyant. Because even with, a, say, a glide bait, for example, those physically still weigh a lot. With a fly, even when it's soaking wet, doesn't weigh even close to what a regular neutral in the water column. Yep. So when a muskie, if it's a fully on fish, when it goes to eat, it's sucking down that whole fly fairly easily. A lot easier for it to pull in that neutrally buoyant fly than it is to pull in a eight plus ounce freaking glide bait, right? Yep. Yep, exactly. Are there eight ounce glide baits? I don't know how big they get. I don't fish glide baits. That's uh that one I was throwing around with you that day. If that was nine ounces. So for the record, <laughs> for the record, I was throwing a fly. I'm just gonna put that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we almost had the coolest eat ever too, next to that blowdown. Um keep going. We threw under a tree with current going this way, and it was one of these angled down trees and the fly went un to the bank, came down, swung in the current, and I had to strip it as fast as I could to keep it from getting into this tree. And at the very end of this blowdown in the tree, this fish just surged out and flashed and gave us the middle finger and went back under the water. Yep. Back under the tree. Uh, we still never got that fish this season. I, that was the third time seeing it. That's all right. It gives us something to look forward to next year. Yep, exactly. Although I don't know if I need you to not take Ben there again because I want to catch it. <laughs> Honestly, Ben just needs revenge off after I think I told you the incident that happened with his big one he lost this year. That's that's a sense. He needs story. revenge. Yeah, he does need he needs some redemption for sure. I agree. Because that should have been oh. that was a bigger fish than he thinks. So the next step here is this is going to be the last thing of Bucktail before the magic happens. And I'll show you why I tie this fly in this order. Because I try tying it the traditional way. And you'll see what I mean by that here in a second. Where normally you tie on these eyes on first. Then you would start building the fly back up forward. The reason I don't do that, and I tie this one single thing of bucktail on first, is that those eyes prevent the Bucktail from spinning all the way around the hook freely. Yep. You know, I'll uh, I'll elaborate just a little bit while you're doing that because I don't think I'm taking away from you doing it. But yep. um, whether we're tying a, a multi-articulated brush fly or a, a 747 or a Hillbilly Deluxe or any other number of articulated flies, uh, when it comes to the front shank, taking the extra time on the first tie-in to maintain consistency in your profile is worth it. Um, it, it. In my opinion, flies swim better once you do that. So uh, yes, fully agree with that. And all I did right there is see if I'll pull this back a little bit. Oh, I just I trimmed up around some of the bucktail around the eye of that shank the, there. The butt all that tail to move a little more free. Yeah. Yep. So, yep, once again, this is just going to be a standard reverse tie here. 
pull that back in. You know, once you've got a hook on there, you have to be a little more careful because more than once, and I guarantee you I'm about to do it, I've stuck myself pretty good doing that. <laughs> I just recorded uh, our, the river pig video, and I, I think that'll show before this when we do it, but people will still laugh at me when it comes up. Not with me, at me. Um, I use the, have you ever seen the Simpsons episode where Marge tests her sewing callus? Yes. He's like lighting it on fire, sticking it with a knife. Like you just can't do anything to it. These jig flies are widow makers. Absolute yeah. widow makers. You will get yourself because you're like, oh, I'm going to get this profile just right. And then when you hook it, I don't care how seasoned you are. Your reflex is to tear away. And these, yep. hooks, these hooks are sticky and that's not an accident. So have fun with that when it happens and try to laugh rather than cry because it yeah. hurts. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, last year, example of hooking, well, it wasn't me hooking myself, had a, you know, hooked and landed. It was like a, it was a less than 30 inch muskie. And I was just going to hand land it. And I think you can see where this is going. Uh, went ahead, slid my hand underneath the gill plate. And that fly had two hooks on it. That uh, rear hook, the fish thrashed and that rear hook buried itself into my, the palm of my hand was still attached to that fish. And I don't blame my girlfriend if she wanted nothing to do with it to try and help me out. So I had to kind of bear hug this muskie while I got the hook out of my hand before it got it in even deeper where we would have had a big issue. Because uh, at that point, it, it was almost through the bar, but it wasn't past it yet. Uh, dude, I saw the worst worst brand of that this, this summer. I'm sure my cousin will watch these videos at some point, too. But he was fishing with my dad. And, and they, you know, just for perspective, I come from a, a bobber and live bait family. Like, we used to mm -hmm. all hang out and you have snacks and drinks and hang out. And, you know, it's fun. Um, my dad still does that. He doesn't fly fish. My, my cousin's just getting into fly fishing. And... Uh, he was helping my dad. He took him out and they had a fish in the net. And you know how every once in a while the fish will lull you to sleep and go ape in the net. And yeah. uh, it happened and the treble hook stinger came out of the fish and two barbs went into my cousin's forearm, like bad. And anyway, just a good reminder to always be cognizant, uh, especially when you have a fish that seems relatively sedated because because they're just trying to lull you to sleep. That's a lie. They're never, yep. they're never just trying to chill out and make it easy. Like you get lucky when it happens, but yes. <laughs> like uh, the fish that me and my girlfriend caught together. She made the entire time until got the hand underneath the go play it. And right when I was pointing the boat, that's when it freaked out and she freaked out. And you know, it just goes to show. Even though the fish looks like it's calmed down, it isn't. So at this point here, this is kind of where the magic of this fly starts to happen. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take these are the aluminum sea eyes in the size uh, three eighths. And these are the large. I'm just using the all black version. They make silver as well. That other thing I'm going to take is uh, four millimeter glass rattles. And the reason for the size for both of these, these just fit right here in front of that uh, tagging of a loop. So are you saying that if you, if you had a larger rattle, because I, I use a different rattle usually, like the glass for me is not proven to be the most durable ever always. Yep. Um, I agree with that. But would you you would choose then to use a slightly longer shank uh, if you were going to use a longer rattle just for the sake of nesting? Yes. Okay. And for me, the rattle isn't, you know, at, when you first start fishing it, it adds a little bit of noise. But the main point of the rattle, add a little more weight to the bottom of the fly so it rides hook up. So once the rattle breaks, I don't worry about it. It's still doing its job in keeping the fly uh hook hook up because sometimes sound does matter for musky fishing but with the amount of water these flies push i think that kind of outsets uh the need of a rattle in a lot of situations not always but sometimes 
So if you didn't have rattles, you wouldn't think twice about tying it and fishing it. Nope. And me and my buddies, usually it's one fish and these rattles are done. Or first time you smoke a rock, the rattle's done. So that fly like still three, fishing. For like three casts then? <laughs> yep, pretty much. And I'll show you a way to make it a little more durable. Except this is only, this is what I do when I'm in production mode, not for a fun tie-in. What I do is I encapsulate the rattle inside of a thing of epoxy. Okay. So that has a little more durability of it. Except that okay. also takes up more time. So when I'm production tie-in, these is, I have a bunch of tails done. So the next step would be when I'm production tying this, get up to here, tie in the eye and then the rattle. And then you do move on to the next section and then finish the rest of the fly. Yep, correct. So I have a bunch of hardware rigged front articulations and then you'd go back through and finish the tie ins and call it a day. Yep. So I need to scoot that eye up just a little bit. Like I said, this just fits. And I just, again, you're on the underside of the shank with those eyes, correct? Correct. You can see here. Then the other thing I just saw, I made the mistake. And I'll show you here in a second of what I just did. So these uh, glass rattles, where's the camera? Right there. You can see that one edge has, one end has a slightly bigger bulge. Okay. That is the end I want to be towards the eyes. So you try to get the extra weight towards the front. It's a little bit of that. If it's more long, it keeps my uh, thread from unraveling. Oh, okay. that, that's, <laughs> that's a main perfect. And if you tie it's... down too tight, will you break the rattle? I have never ever yet. With two, could it be possible? Feet. Yes, but unlikely. That's good to know. When I go to tying. I don't know how many of these I've never broken one tying it. So that next step here. Now that that's sitting nicely. I take the super glue, and when I say I douse it, I douse this thing so that once I start finishing to tie this, the rattle and the eyes will not move. Like right there, the rattle just moved a little bit. I'm going to fix that up. Do you use the hardest hole yep. ever? Not as much as I used to. I still do on tying like epoxy head style flies for if I'm using the UV. I still have a lot of, this will be a throwback for people who've been tying a long time. I still have an old stash of a clear cure goo. Oh, that's you sneaky guy. <laughs> so that, that business hasn't been around in quite a few years now. This stuff in a syringe? Yep. So when you did this a head stuff. with those, you had to use a, I always use the hard as nails or hard as hull to uh, get rid of the tackiness and just let that glue set a little bit. Then I like your hat. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's been good to me this season. Oh, it's got good mojo for sure. Like I'm always nervous buying a new hat for that reason. Actually, <laughs> there's two hats that I bought in the past two years. I wore them for two trips and threw them away. That's funny. There's, there's no mojo in those, huh? No mojo. I've seen I've seen a lot of high forties plus inch fish in Muskie Town hats this year, and there there weren't a ton of them out when it started. So I'm pretty happy. Mm -hmm. with that. It's been a good year. It really has been. So this next step here is where things get to get tricky, and things have to have a tight fit. Because what we're going to have is one more bunch of reverse tied bucktail. We're going to have a set of pectoral fins being uh, orange feathers. We're going to have a collar of flashable, red flashable. And also, <laughs> uh, what this stuff is called, it's craft hair. It's a craft hair dubbing brush. Where this is all black version with, I think it's a, this is a UV black. So it's got this kind of blue tint to it in the flash. They were trying to fit a lot in a very little space. This is where the more you tie these, the better you'll get. And we're going to see here, it's been a minute since I've tied one of these, so we're going to see how well this goes for me. 
I got a good feeling about it. And typically, even when I'm production time, these, I always have to tie a bunch of bucktail on the top and then on the bottom. It, it's, of the, sorry, keep going. Yep. And that's due to the rattle and the ice preventing the bucktail from actually spinning around. So one right there. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking estimated about half of what I've been doing for the other bucktail here. Since half is going on top, half of it's on going on bottom. And I mean, if you really want to get picky, you could go hair by hair and count, but. Yeah, we're not doing that. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's musky fishing. They don't care too much. Bit. it's funny there, there's two trains of thought about that because i'm about as nitty as it gets like if i'm mm-hmm. gonna fly and i'm not gonna want to change it all day i'm gonna know it's tied perfectly and it needs to swim exactly like i want and every single hair needs to be like i mean buttoned up yep and honestly i'm like if i'm giving flies to a friend or something that's how i'm with their stuff for my own personal stuff I, you know, my realization is they don't care too much. Well, and you'll if catch fish either way. Yeah. Yeah. If the fly's got mojo, it's got mojo. If it doesn't, it gets the uh, gets the scissors and get it. It gets hacked apart because there's plenty of flies. The more you tie, and the more you fish muskies, you're going to start to see that pattern of flies having mojo and flies not. Yeah. Of course, with that said, there's Ben would remember this fly because it's currently in his box. There's a fly I have. It's still probably the Buford that I've ever t- most mojo Pacific fly I've ever tied for a muskie. It's caught in one. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of mojo that fly has and only caught in one fish is honestly kind of sad. <laughs> Just gets all the attention though. I threw that fly for two years and never caught a fish on it. <laughs> but you probably had, a, you probably still have a ton of confidence in it, right? Oh, I love that fly. Yeah, yeah. I still definitely. love it. <laughs> and that's that's part of what's sick about this. I mean, it, you could you could have boxes and boxes of flies and change, or you could have the one that you feel great about and fish it, and you probably have a similar chance of catching. Mm-hmm. It. Because honestly, still in my opinion, muskies are not that hard to catch, whether with fly or gear, in a lot of circumstances. Like if it's a high density fishery, muskies really are the dumbest fish that swims. You mean you don't think the fish that hits your trolling motor is the smartest fish in the whole wide world? (laughs) Definitely not. So let me ask you this, and you and I talked about a little bit of this. Of course. This is for, for folks who are watching this. What would you say, you know, okay, these fish are temperamental and picky and, you know, particular about the angle of attack. What do you think it is that differentiates the people that that really like click with it and find a a rhythm with a fly rod versus the ones that don't? Part of it is confidence. That's a big part. Like I'm a firm believer. I don't care how bad of a cast I just made. I believe every cast I make is going to catch a muskie. Every cast doesn't matter how bad of a cast I made that is going to catch a muskie that I'm a firm believer in the mentality part of it. And I'm, it's almost like muskies can sense it. And I'll be so honest, the hardest muskie to ever get as your first, that is your hardest muskie you're ever going to get as your first muskie. Cause then things start to click as far as once you get your first things start clicking It's like, okay, I did that with that fish. If I can keep repeating that, I might catch another one. And it's just learning, you know, every fishery is different too. Like if I care more about numbers, there's, you know, in Wisconsin, there are so many fisheries that are known as numbers fisheries where you can go out and catch, you know, over five a day. Versus there's also the low density stuff, which is the stuff I currently fish where I might go a couple months without seeing a fish. So it's also understand your fisheries is 
if you're first starting out on a low density fishery, you're going to hate your life, honestly. Because <laughs> it's going to take a lot of time to get your first and to learn because you don't have a lot of fish to learn off of. So I guess actually I can leave with some advice there if you can. Uh, start out fishery in a higher density fishery because you're going to learn more based on the, you'll see more fish on a high density fishery. So you'll be able to learn a lot more that way. Good knowledge. So the next part here, I'm going to be taking this red flash boot and I'm going to be creating the, I call it kind of a flash collar. All it is is really, I'm just trying to add a little more flash into this fly. And that's something else some people, you know, have different opinions about. I'm still a firm believer in there's too much flash, but also I have friends that are the complete opposite where if there's any flash, they don't like it. Okay. I'm in advance for anyone watching. I just clicked something a second ago here and I may end up cutting this out if it's irrelevant, but in the event that you have a split screen right now and you had full screens before, I'm not exactly sure what got clicked. <laughs> and we will try to find a way to zoom in so that you can see Justin's screen better than my ugly mug. So, yeah. Okay. So this, I actually go ahead and I, I measure against that last clump of bucktail I tied in to create an estimate of how long I need the uh, flash to be because I like it to be as long as a bucktail. Then I go ahead and fold that in half. Then over my garbage, because I'm trying to keep things a little bit cleaner here. Clean off all that excess. So now I have the exact amount of flash I need, the length that I need. And I do this kind of in two parts here where I do the top half, then the bottom half. So I'm going to do two fairly tight wraps like that. Then I'm going to take my thumb or finger and kind of spread that flash throughout the top end of that fly. Like that. Just kind of ev evenly dispute it if you can. And, and for anyone who can't see Justin's uh, screen that closely, say my finger here is the, the top of the hook shank. He's saying that when you first tie your flash in, it'll kind of be in like a stacked line like this. It'll be in line with the hook shank. And when he's taking his finger and, and distributing, he's actually making that flash. So it sits like this kind of evenly across all that material on the top of the hook shank. And you don't need it to go mm -hmm. underneath. You don't need your flash kind of on the underside of the right. Like They can definitely see it across the top. Uh, and that really is the extent of that. Yeah. For me, at least, of you know flash distribution. I'm sure there's folks that like flash all around the fly. And if I'm using a brush, maybe it'll go around. But there we go. So there, the flash is pretty well even all, all around the fly. So you do you do it all the way around? Depends on the pattern, honestly. This is one of the few that I do, like on Buford's. Um, trying to think here. A couple of the other patterns that tie, I don't. Okay. Like if it's a more tight and round fly like this, and by tight and round, I mean there really isn't a – big distinction between the top and the bottom of the fly. Uh, with these kind of flies, I like it to distri distribute around the whole fly. If it's a Buford or like if it's a two-toned fly where the, like uh, if I had a white belly on this, I would only put that dark flash over the top. Then the next step here, is to take our feathers and this creates the pectoral fins is what I always call them. And all I'm doing is I'm taking the short feathers towards the base of the hook. I'm not using any of these long feathers up because all this is is going to act like the little fins on the uh, a bait fish. And, and they add contrast too, right? I mean, yep. it, it helps the fish see, it helps the fish see the fly. And what I'm doing is I'm picking out it's going to be uh, two pairs of feathers. I'm going to keep them uh, to the same stiff as stiffness as I can and to the same uh, width as I can. Because if you don't do that, sometimes the official, the fly will work a little bit funky, we'll call it that way, where it might only kick to one side instead of doing a nice boom, boom like that. It might boom, boom like that. Cool. 
keep the tips even and this is a little tip of your production tie-in here. I'll find the length I want right about there. Clip out the excess. What I do is I take one of the feathers I just clipped to make sure they're the same length on the other side. I'm going to match up those two tips quick. Right about there. I'm going to take the feather I just clipped and put that right over the top. So I'm essentially measuring so that they're the exact length. Clip that right there. There, all four of those feathers are the exact same length now. And you can go ahead and also make your own, uh, on my own bench, I have a measuring tape already built into the desk. <laughs> So I can just boom, boom, boom like that. But if people don't want to destroy their desk. I always have one pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the days when we weren't, you know, when it was time for me and, and you know, we weren't saying, hey, your fly's going to be this long. And so, like now when I'm tying, I usually know exactly how long it's going to be before we even start. Then one other trick I'm going to show you, I just did it on this side, except I'm going to show you on this side so you can see exactly what I did. Try it. Normally, I like to turn it so I can see what I'm doing, except so everyone else can see. I'm going to put down the length. And what I'm doing, I'm matching it up with the eyes. Those eyes are on perfectly straight. So I'm using the eyes as more of the measurement of where I want to put the feathers. So right about there. I'm going to hold that down tight. I'm going to throw on a couple wraps. So it doesn't move around. Then what I'm going to do is these little tag ends right here. I'm going to add around, tie it off. And if they're a little bit longer, you can go ahead and clip them off like I'm about to do. The reason why I tie that those buttons backwards as well is it prevents the feathers from slipping out. This is the EP brush right here. I'm going to use exactly half of this brush. So I just went ahead and folded it in half. So now I have enough material for two flies there. Then I'm going to take what you'll see is there's the end I just clipped and then there's one that already has just bare wire. I take the end that I clipped and I tie that in. And you see why here in a minute. Go ahead and you know throw a bunch of wraps down. Then I go ahead and bring the thread right up behind the eyes. Then kind of the final step for building this fly is I put a bunch of super glue down. <laughs> Make sure those feathers don't slip and the flash won't slip. And I let that dry for a minute. So if I still, what I'm going to end up doing here is I'm going to start wrapping this while it's still semi wet. And basically what that's going to create is a actually bulletproof uh, head on this fly. So as that's drying, what I like to do is I try and comb all that EP fiber, the crap hair, to one side, if I can. So that's about dry enough. Gonna go ahead and keep turning it around. And as I wrap, I'm constantly pulling the fibers back towards the tail end of the fly. Then as I wrap, I'm also picking at it a little bit. Keep all the flat fibers from getting tangled. Do you always finish this fly with the EP brush? Do you ever do any other variations? I've done, there's a, another version of this fly that I, oh, what was the name we came up for that thing? Where instead of the, this exact brush we used, um, oh, what is it used? The Game Changer Chenille. Okay. And didn't have the exact action of this fly, but, you know, I still caught fish on it. Okay. So you can get away. You always can substitute materials. It just might affect what the fly does. Then what I'm doing here, I'm just taking the point end of my scissors 
you can go ahead and use a needle or anything you have handy and just keep plucking at that those hairs to keep them from being tangled as i wrap this and this is why i make it a point of tying it down with the and so then we have a free wire here that's easy and nice to hold on to So right there's the last wrap. And as you can see, everything just fits. And as I tie it down, I personally no longer like I have tied so many of these. I know the exact length I need. So I don't even have to cut off that tag end of the wire down anymore. As soon as I start wrapping thread over it, it sinks down right into the fly. There we go. Then I go ahead and take my scissors once again and just part away the material a little bit, get any of the tangled stuff undone. And when we share this, uh, when we share this video, I feel like I feel like we have to do a little uh, montage just of fish that you have caught just from this last year or two. Uh, that just, works for me, dude. <laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine you did, you didn't mind. Uh, it, it it's kind of incredible. Uh, just some the reason we do this uh, and, and mm -hmm. to do it with the frequency that you have. Uh, thank you for sharing how to tie the war pig here. I, I think it's a cool pattern. I, I think I really like it too because of the simplicity of it. It's uh, yes, not the most elaborate pattern ever, and and you know especially when folks are just getting into tying. You know, to have something that you have confidence in that you don't have to overthink has a lot of value. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a really cool pattern. It isn't just a musky fly. The amount of species I've caught on this is still adding up. <laughs> then kind of the final, this is only if you want to. So these eyes are built so that you can add uh, your own eyes onto them. So this is where I take my gel super glue and I already have my eyes picked out here. And the eyes that fit in these are the eight millimeter or the five sixteenth is the what are what fit fit on the inside here. Nice. I, re I really like the the living eyes uh, from from Flyman. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are some of my favorites. And to finish off Fly Fly, just glue on the whole thing on any of the bare thread that's left. Do you coat the outside of the eyes or no? Yep, just with super glue though. It's gotta be a clear finishing super glue, right? Yep, it's, as long as you don't touch it, it dries clear. <laughs> <laughs> like as soon as, like I'm a very impatient tire. So once I've let it set long enough, like even if you look at my fingers right now, you see that, that there's multiple coats of glue on there because I got impatient and just sort of trying to get rid of all the excess. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, is there anything you want to add just to wrap up at the end here? Um, honestly, not that I can think of. Um, this, I guess, with this fly, you can fish it with a floating line, intermediate, and also a fast sink. So if, if you're just starting out, it's a great fly for if you only have a floating line and the eight weight, which is what it's designed for. It's a great easy cast and eight weight fly with a floating line. So you don't necessarily have to go out and buy all this special equipment if you just want to try musky fly fishing is the one thing I'll add to this. Yeah, I think that's all, that's definitely helpful. And if you think of anything else that you want to add after we you know, close this off and we want to do any additions, mm -hmm. uh, just let me know, we'll, we'll make sure that it's added for everyone. But. Uh, uh, yeah, so that was tying the war pig with Justin Hokinson, uh, one of the fishiest guys in the craft. Uh, thank you again for being here tonight, Justin, and to everybody who watched this. Uh, we'll look forward to sharing more on the next episode.